exciting because I'm really interested in post medieval salt making in Scotland and what we're looking at here is a, 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 an incredibly rare survival. You know, you'll never see this anywhere else ever in the rest of your life. Um, so this building, we're looking at a, a, pa a pan house, which its function was to boil seawater in big metal pans using coal from local coal fields to make salt to sell for money. And that money was reinvested back into the coal mines. Okay, so that's the big picture stuff. So in around 1630, so we're going about 400 years, we're barely out of the medieval period, wow. this D-shaped stone building was constructed. We're only looking at half of it, so we're standing on top of some of it, and it probably goes back into the kitchen of the church hall behind us here. So it probably would have had two rooms. The front room is called the pan chamber, and this is where the, the iron pan was that was filled with seawater to make salt and then the fore chamber was where the salt was dried and stored and probably people would live um, in the fore chamber because it's a 24-hour process and um, you'd need someone on site all the time monitoring the fire and monitoring the salt so it's also a domestic space in early industrial sites there's a real blurring of dom domestic and industrial you know you, it's not an either or thing that happens much later on so this, all archaeological sites are basically a mishmash of lots of different things that happened at different periods, but we're seeing them all at the same time, so they're quite complicated. So I'm just going to try and describe it to you in phases, okay? So I'm going to go right back to the 1630s, and we would be standing, well we wouldn't be standing up here, we'd be a couple of metres down, but in the 1630s this stone apsidal building was constructed, and then these inside, you have these internal stone walls and a little wall here. Probably more walls that are buried that we can't see underneath here, just studs. And those, all their function was is to support the pan, which was sort of 18 foot by 9 foot by 1 foot, so a massive pan. So it needed a very solid foundation. So this supported the pan. 400 years ago there were no like rolling mills you couldn't roll out a nice big flat sheet of iron so the pans were made out of plates which were about that big and riveted together which made them easy to fix as well because they're that you know they're being heated all the time they're full of seawater they rust through and so having plates made them easy to easy to um, fix so in the early days the fire was just on the ground on so the bedrock ground level is at the bottom of those two pits you can see there so probably a meter below from where the brick is now so can you see there's a brick arch in this wall here that would have been an opening a doorway there there would have been a doorway on this side and you can also see just the remnants of um, an opening in a seaward wall as well so door opening door and that was to bring in coal to make the fire on the ground and also to rake out the ash as well so there's no room for a chimney in any of these walls because they're full of doors. Um, so probably the chimney is like right here. In the cross wall, that's where the chimney would have been. So a fire on the ground, a pan underneath, a massive pan supported on these, these stone walls and the chimney where I am now. To get the seawater in, they either would have just used buckets and people going down and getting buckets and pouring them in, or they might have had a system where they would have um, they would like build a little um, a raised sort of a raised wooden pipe and then they'd have a bucket on the end of a wand and then they'd get, oh, put the bucket yeah. in, pour the water into this raised wooden trough or pipe mm -hmm. and it would just come directly into the pan mm -hmm. and maybe just a little um, sort of wooden uh, plate or something to, 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 uh, to stop the water <laughs> flow or a tap, a simple tap. <laughs> So that's what was happening in the 17th century. Be careful there, because that's not, don't stand on that. I'm going to come back, it's okay. Just, um, you can go round, yeah, go round. Just that that's not this bit. Um, yeah, that's fine. Okay, yeah, yeah. great. Sorry. No, it's okay. I just don't want to miss. You might disappear into a hole. <laughs> so all the br bricks you're looking at um, are possibly 100, 150 years after um, the the stone supported pan and it we're looking at the remnants of a brick hearth which is doing exactly the same thing but it's just that technology has moved on so 
inserted into this open space in this in the pan chamber you have a brick hearth so these two square holes that you see are just that they're, they're artificial actually these are ash pits which come all the way along so that you can see just mm -hmm. they've only just been partially excavated so they would come all the way along and somewhere underneath our feet the ends of them would have big metal doors across them and you just open the doors to rake out the ash so above the ash pits you have this is amazing probably an 18th century iron bar which is just the remnants of a grate so instead of having a fire on the ground you now have a fire on a grate above ash pits which is much more efficient and it means you can control your fire a lot better as well and the pan would probably only be about that far above the above the grate um, so you'd have a bed of hot you know coals and then the pan above and then in in that second phase you've then then because you've got we've lost some of the superstructure here so you've got the grate and then your pan and the, and that is the behind the the um, ash pits you've got the remnants of a chimney so the chimney would then be it's changed changed direction and the chimney is now on the seaward end of the of the building and we think we're having a lot of discussion about bricks today because dress and pans bricks yeah so. how, how i mean i just don't know enough about early bricks mm -hmm. i think those are 18th century bricks but that's a guess They're handmade, mm -hmm. handmade, nice and there was narrow a brick bricks. Box along at Preston Pans, there, wasn't there? There is so a brick, so there's a lot of there's brick yeah. making around here. Mm -hmm. I just don't know how early yeah. it goes. I don't know. I mean, it could be earlier. I don't know, but they just by the 19th century. So this, all of the sea salt making industry in Scotland stopped in the mm -hmm. 1820s when they um, they basically stopped taxing imported salt. Um, so there was no market for Scottish mm -hmm. salt. It was never very good. So the houses were there until until the 1920s or 40s. Yeah. So you're standing. If you look down, you can see where the toilet was on the ground there. You're in the toilet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this was the, ki the kitchen. Why is it so red? Is it the brick or is it the iron? That's a very good question. The bricks are naturally red because they've oxidized, it's oxidized clay. But the other red stuff you see is this is all just the waste from the fires. So all of that material that's filling it up is all, um, we call it, it's just like ash, fuel slag, yeah, coal. It's beautiful, yeah. I don't know, but I'm going to meet him very soon because um, yeah. Oh, okay. So there are now, I mean, there are now three artisan salt makers in Scotland. There's the um, Blackthorn salt, which I think is what you're talking about with the graduation tire process, which is in fact not, that's a German process, but be really, really interesting to see it done here. There's East Nukes uh, salt works in uh, St. Monans in Fife. And there's the Isle of Skye um, Sea Salt Company who use polytunnels and, and 